flow. Okay, hey guys. So um, over the last couple of months, I've had a few conversations um, or encounters with people where the term evidence-based fitness or evidence-based bodybuilding was either critiqued or mocked or there was a suggestion that we should do away with this term. Um, and so I wanted to do a video just to sort of bring some clarity to what this term actually means and where it originated and why it's actually extremely important for us when applied properly. And so just to be clear, I, as I see it, um, the term evidence-based fitness and science-based fitness those are sort of synonymous, so they basically mean the same thing. So the fitness community basically borrowed this term from the medical community. So in medicine in the early 1990s, uh, there was this movement that was set towards preventing physicians from just sort of arbitrarily choosing research and then subjectively applying that research and their own preferences or techniques that had been handed down to them. Um, within clinical practice to sort of guide their treatment and so on. So basically what came about was an actual systematized approach to incorporating scientific research into medical practice. And so a few definitions have popped up since then. Uh, my personal favorite comes from Dr. David Sackett, which describes evidence-based medicine as the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. It means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. So you guys can see that by this definition, evidence-based practice, whether that be fitness or medicine, doesn't mean that all we look at is scientific studies. Built into the very definition of evidence-based practice, is that there will be an individual clinical expertise component um, and that is of particular importance for guiding things like say surgeries where there's hand-on techniques. The clinician sort of has to use his own experience and the experience of those who have sort of preceded him uh, in order to like sort of make the best judgment there. Um, so we can do away with the complaint that you know us evidence-based folks we only look at studies since built into the very definition itself is this integration component where we have to just sort of come up with our best practice based on our own clinical expertise, field experience, and then the, the systematic research um, as well. So just to shine a little bit more light on this criticism, you'll often hear people say things like, well, we don't really have enough research, or at least not enough high quality research, uh, done on bodybuilders, so we shouldn't really focus on the research too much. What we should just do is, you know, what works. Um, and so if we think of this criticism in a medical context, um, it would be sort of like saying, well, you know, we don't really have any randomized controlled trials where you have, you know, victims who are stabbed in the heart in one, you know, group and then we, and they're given a certain treatment and then we have victims who are stabbed in the heart and they're given another treatment and then we compare the two of these. We sort of just, you know, come up with the best protocol in that situation. If someone comes into the emergency room and is stabbed in the heart, we can integrate clinical expertise in terms of actually directing that surgery, rely on the evidence that we do have, and then come up with the best practice forward. And similarly, in bodybuilding, there will be cases where uh, that particular athlete's individual preferences or specific needs due to injury or whatever will be a case where we don't have any studies directly investigating what it is that we should do there. But again, this is where that whole expertise and best practice idea comes into play. Okay, so I'm going to post on the screen a list of standards that were put forth by Dr. Stephen Novella, who founded Science-Based Medicine. Reasonably accounts for all available evidence, utilizes valid and internally consistent logic, is intellectually thorough, rigorous, and methodical, reasonably fair and unbiased in judgments, and adheres to standards of ethics and professionalism. So in my opinion, I think that the scientific fitness community or whatever is actually doing pretty well with the first one. 
to me there seems to be no real shortage of scientific papers floating around. Uh, people always seem to be sharing new studies and talking about new research and stuff like that. So that's good. Um, the second one to do with utilizing valid and internally consistent logic isn't great overall in the fitness community, clearly, but I think that within the niche of the science-based folks, it's actually pretty good and people usually tend to come up with conclusions that actually logically follow from the evidence that um, they're sort of showing there. So the third criteria uh, I think definitely could be improved on. Um, so that's being intellectually thorough, rigorous, and methodical. Um, and I don't think that a lot of people are as thorough as they should be. And you'll often see people just sort of cherry pick one study, post the abstract, and then use that as support for whatever it is that they're trying to prove or whatever. And I find that a lot of people don't really rigorously look through the papers themselves and they'll just read the abstract without actually looking at, you know, the researcher's methods or the subjects and so on. Um, and so I think that we could all probably do a little bit better uh, or most of us could do a little bit better with that one, myself included. And then the fourth one is being reasonably fair and unbiased in judgments. And I think that this is a big one um, because in this community, a lot of people are financially tied to a certain set of beliefs. It's how they get paid. Um, everyone has to have you know, their own sort of method or whatever. And so if some research comes out that you know, stands in, in contrast to or conflicts with your, your own convictions or previously held beliefs, then oftentimes people are going to get defensive and sort of denigrate that research and not take it into account. And this is just the very definition of being biased. And now we all obviously have biases and if you've read any, anything on you know, cognitive biases, then you know that we all sort of are limited by this. Um, but I think that the main thing here is the word reasonable. So I think that we can strive to be reasonably unbiased in our judgments while acknowledging that we will still be biased to some degree, even if on you know, a subconscious level. Um, yeah. So the final one has to do with standards of ethics and professionalism. And I think that this is probably the biggest one and it's the one where we can, we have the most room to improve on. So I think like what I found is that people who even do the first four perfectly uh, tend not to do so well with this one. And I'm of the opinion that it, you know, if your only method of spreading the, you know, the good word is by being rude and elitist and intentionally confrontational online or wherever, um, then I think that improving upon this standard should probably be your main focus in terms of actually propelling yourself forward in your evidence-based practice. That isn't to say that we shouldn't criticize bad ideas or we shouldn't think critically about ideas or even that we shouldn't ridicule some people for their ignorance, particularly people who are speaking from a position of, of authority and are just spewing bullshit out to the masses. And just to, just to read a quick excerpt from one of my favorite books, uh, it's called On Bullshit by Harry Frankfurt. And, um, what he says in this book is, bullshit is unavoidable whenever circumstances require someone to talk without knowing what he is talking about. Thus, the production of bullshit is stimulated whenever a person's obligations or opportunities to speak about some topic exceed his knowledge of the facts that are relevant to that topic. And he basically goes on to say, uh, you know, that, that bullshit is actually a bigger threat than lies uh, because at least those people who lie are cognizant, they're aware of the fact that there is some truth to be spoken about, whereas the person who bullshits just doesn't care. They're just saying whatever is in their best interest. Um, and so uh, this is a real obstacle to be overcome within the fitness based community. And so I think that we are right to criticize these people and even in some cases ridicule these people. Um, but uh, I think that when this is your main method of getting the you know, information out there, we will sometimes fail to adhere to this standard of professionalism and ethics and so on. And so uh, we can probably do a little bit better uh, in that regard. 
All right guys, so that's all I had to say on the whole evidence-based thing. If you guys wanna keep up with some of our lifestyle stuff, you can go ahead and follow my girlfriend Robin's channel. I'll put a link to her channel below. She's doing an awesome job of filming everything that we're doing and uh, I'm gonna try to follow suit and post some of my training and my dieting and uh, just day-to-day -day stuff for you guys. So stay tuned for that. All right, thanks for watching. Like the video if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks.